the book of Isaiah, found in the Old Testament, the sixth chapter. The book of Isaiah, the sixth chapter. How many of God loves you today? Amen. Amen. We just sang two songs about the goodness of God, the love of God. And I think they got a song for the altar call is going to go that, go that way. And so God's good to us. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8. Then said I, excuse me, verse 8, moving back, moving too far down. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. Amen. With the help of the Lord, I'd like to minister on the title of a message using that last portion of that verse. Here am I. Here am I, Reverend Walker, sir. Would you please pray for the offering or service? Thank you. Thank you. God, for such a time as this, for drawing men and women out to your house to hear the words of eternal life. I ask now that you would unshin the man of God afresh, that you would lead God, direct him, that you would make preaching easy. Send forth your words, soften hearts. Give us all ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord has to say unto the church. And we will be careful to give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor for us. In Jesus Christ, most precious and most holy name, we pray these things. Amen. 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 Then said I, here am I, send me. Send me. This portion of scripture that's found here in this sixth chapter of Isaiah is amazing. It's a historical account that took place during the, after the death of King Uzziah. We see it in verse 1 as we look right there right out the gate. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Uzziah was a good king. He uh, won many battles for the Lord. He did many great exploits. You can read about it in First or Second Chronicles, I believe, chapter 26. And um, at the end of his reign, though, he got a little bit lifted up. And he decided to go into the temple and offer incense, and that wasn't his job. That was the priest's job. And because of it, he, the priest rebuked him and said, No, you can't do that, king. But he was insistent to do so, and as he began to do so, and take it upon himself to do something that was not his job, was not his right, he was struck with leprosy. He would be shut away, and uh, basically he himself removed himself from the temple at that point when he realized his error, and he would be in a, in a several house, and then he would ultimately pass away. And we see here, at the end of his reign, that's when the Lord shows himself to Isaiah. The Lord shows himself to Isaiah. We don't know all that it transpired necessarily before this in the life of Isaiah, but we do know one thing that Uzziah was a good king. And with his passing, maybe the hope of the, of the country, the hope of the nation because a good king had passed away. Maybe he was close friends with Isaiah. It's really good, really possibly they were both leaders, one a spiritual leader, the other the king, obviously, a secular leader. And maybe his passing was like an old friend passing away. But regardless of how or what the condition was, it was at this moment that Isaiah saw the Lord. It says here, and then I'm going to read it to you now. I'm going to read to you once again. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. You know, every, it, there comes a time in every man's woman or life if they're, going, if they're going to make it to heaven, and if they're going to be what they were created to be, they have to see God. Yes. The Word of God says where there is no vision, the people perish. When we don't have a vision of what we're doing and what we're about, we just aimlessly wander and get involved in all kinds of nonsense and things that do not profit. Oh, they may help us financially, and we may accomplish many things, but they, there'll always be this sense of, I'm not where I'm supposed to be. Something's missing. And that's because every person in their heart of hearts has a God-shaped hole, has a place that only God can fill, and God made you for a specific purpose. He didn't make you just to exist. He didn't make you just to drift. He didn't create you just to go through life and really never do anything worthwhile. You know, we look for, and I, you know, I, I'm preaching to a bunch of people that were in the military or are in the military. And most everybody, when I ask people why they joined the Marine Corps, they say, because I wanted to be, I wanted to be a part of the best. That's what they say. Now, I wasn't in the Marines, and I can contest with you concerning that, if that's true or not. But the reality is, everybody that I know, very many people that I know that say they joined the Marines, said the reason they did it is they said they wanted to join the best. They wanted to, they wanted to do something worthwhile. They wanted to accomplish a certain purpose. They wanted to be a part of something that was noteworthy. And 
And so it is. That's honorable. That's a, a good pursuit. I'm here to share with you the most important thing you could ever be a part of. And that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. The most important thing you can ever give, or give your life to. And that God's call upon your heart. To, each of us is called to different places and a different purpose. In God's church, we have a place. God has a place for you in his house. We're thankful you're here tonight. We're not thanking you for coming to church because we ought to be in the house of God. Amen? Amen. How many believe we should be in church? Amen. 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 That's, what, that's what we ought to do. and It's good to be here. Amen. But here in this specific situation, hello, Gene. Glad you're here, brother. Glad you're here. All right. A Haitian brother. All right. He's going to teach me French one day. Probably not. Probably not. But I can do French fries. That's about all I do. All right. Moving along. But we see in this sixth chapter of Isaiah that the king had died, and all of a sudden, life became a reality. Sometimes something drastic has to happen in our lives to get our attention. Some ma major uh, event, maybe somebody passing away or the death of a loved one. Uh, something happens and it gets our attention. It wakes us up. Thank God for those moments. Because if they didn't happen, we'd keep drifting. Yeah. Amen. Amen. We would keep drifting, going on the way life always was, and we would never really meet God and let God make a reality in our lives. Thank God for the interruption. Thank God for the difficulty. Thank God for the hardship. Thank God for the struggle. Why? Because it's in that, as one writer, one man said, he said, pain is, is God's megaphone to get our attention. And every one of us have heard at some point in our lives, and mostly it was when we were hurting that we finally reached up to God and said, God, help me. Amen. God, help me. God, save me. God, do a work in my life. And so here, King or Isaiah, rather, after the king died, saw the Lord. He saw the Lord. Listen to what I love. With it. God intervenes. There's more at stake than our little world. See, maybe Isaiah was having a pity party. Maybe he was distracted with the passing of the king. But the reality was is he was God's man. And there was a whole nation that needed him. There was a nation that needed this leader. And this leader had to get out of his own head so he could be what God wanted him to be. So he could help and assist. God had a call upon his life. God needs us to get out of our headspace sometimes, see the Lord, get a vision of eternity, get focused on what really matters so that God can use us for the purpose that we've been called to. Right. Say, well, I'm not called to be a preacher. No, but you might end up overseas in a combat zone and your unit's going to need a Christian. Amen. Yes. Are you listening? Your unit's going to need somebody that isn't just a churchgoer, but that somebody knows God. Yes. They need someone that has a reality. Amen. Your family needs somebody that has a reality in God. Not just a churchgoer, but somebody that knows God. Someone that has met the Lord and knows Him. So when the chaotic things of life come our way, they can, you can stop and say, I know what we should do. Let's pray. I know who we need to look to. Let's look to God. I know who can meet the needs. His name is Jesus. Amen? Amen. And you can be stable, steadfast, unmovable, unshakable, as Jerry was talking the other day, in the midst of the difficulties of life. Does that mean you may not have a level of fear come over you? You may, but the God inside of you will resist the fear, push it back, and by the love of God, you'll be able to stand. You'll be able to stand. Amen. Bible had to tell you there in the Word of God in Joshua, he had to be told over three, over four times to be very courageous. Fear not. Why did God have to tell him that? Because he was afraid. God was telling him, don't be afraid. And so in this portion of Scripture, once again, he said he saw the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, like I'm a, southern, like I'm a southerner, the Lord. How do you say it, Reverend Walker? If we get it right, all right, he can help me out. All right. He saw the Lord high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. Now, this wasn't a train, like a choo-choo train. Kind of like a wedding garment train, that effect. It was God's train, His royal train. Yeah. It filled the temple. And this is what the Word of God says He saw. Above this train, now He's in the tabernacle, He's in the temple. He said, above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With twain He covered His face, with twain He covered His feet, and with twain He did fly. So these six wings, these these three different pairs of wings, one covered the face, covered the feet, and the other two, they flew. What was going on? They covered the face and the feet because they were intimidated by the holiness and the, and the glory of God. And so they were shielding themselves. Even though they were angelic and glorious beings, in the presence of God, they were hiding them in their face. They were hiding, they were covering themselves in the presence of a glorious God. And they cried out, I love what it says here. And one cried unto the another, unto another, and said, Holy Holy, holy. And I picture this, like, holy, holy, 
Holy is the Lord God Almighty. Back and forth as they cry out to one another. And he goes, he goes on to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, rather. The whole earth is full of his glory. As they began to be in the presence of God, as the temple began to fill. Can you imagine if God's train filled this place? If right now God stepped into this place, we saw God in all of his glory, he'd probably have to lift the roof off of it just to fit in here. But the fact is, I think we would say we had church that day. I think it'd be fair to say that you would not be bored and you wouldn't be on your phones. Now, nobody's on their phone right now, I don't think. But I think God would have our attention. Is that accurate? Yes. Amen. And you know what? God is present here right now by the Holy Ghost. Amen. The same God that Isaiah saw is present right here. And if God will touch your senses, you'll be aware of it and you'll even feel him. He's here right now to meet the needs in your life. God is very much here. But when Isaiah saw the Lord, it impacted him in such a way. And listen to what, look what happens here. One cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. So they were getting excited. Holy! They were going, Dear the beloved, we gather here together today to talk about Jesus. They were crying out. Holy! Holy! And such, such, such uh, reverence and such uh, uh, glory and such praise that the very, the very pillars as we just read to you, the posts and the door moved at the voice of, the, of them that cried. The house was filled with smoke. There was smoke everywhere and it wasn't a smoke machine. Amen. It wasn't a rock concert. Yes. Amen? Amen? God was doing a work. And when God doesn't work in your life, a lot of things go. And when I got saved, I got rid of my rock and roll. I don't know why I'm sharing that that's not here. I started listening to things that worked that praise yes. God. Amen? Yes. started to glorify Jesus yes. because God lived in my heart. I wasn't listening to ACDC anymore. I wasn't on my highway to hell. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Sister. Thank you. All right. All right. Well, I like Iron Man, and he sings it. Like I said, Iron Man needs to get saved. Amen. He's cool and everything, but he's Tony Stark needs Jesus. I know he's not real. All right. Amen. Robert Downey Jr. We'll leave it at that. All right. We all need Jesus. Amen? Amen. And so he says they were just taken back. These angelic beings were in complete awe. They cried out, the divine, their divine voice shook this temporal world. And God wants to do a work in your life. And when the Spirit of God begins to impact your heart, it'll shake your temporal world. You won't be always comfortable in the house of God. Hallelujah. Thank God for that. Amen. You won't be comfortably numb like the old rock song says. Drifting into eternity, lost and on your way to hell. But God shakes us and gets our attention so we can go to heaven. Amen? Amen. Thank God that he interrupts our lives. Amen. Thank God that he gets our attention. Thank God that he doesn't work in our life. Oh, thank God Jesus knows, how, knows the right way. He's so good, too. He knows how to touch us in a way to where we run to him and not from him. Amen? Amen. Thank God for his goodness. Thank God God is a God of love. And so this is what he says here. And I'm, this is so much here. Verse 5. What did Isaiah say when he saw God? He said, I'm good. I'm the man. I'm God's prophet. I'm the top dog in, in Israel. I, I got this covered. That's, that's not what he said. When he saw the Lord... Here in this, when he saw the Lord, this was his response in verse 5. Woe is me. And there's an exclamation point on it. <laughs> he saw the Lord in all of its glory, and he said, Woe is me. He saw himself in the presence of God. You know, when we see God in a real way, we see ourselves, and we'll say, just like Isaiah did, Woe is me. Woe is me. God, I need your help. I need you to do a work in my life. Even if we're living for God, even if there's glory in our hearts and God's done a great work in our lives, still in the presence of an awesome, flawless, flawless God, Amen. there'll be a sense of how small we are in his presence. And there'll be an attitude of repentance. Yes. And we'll say like David, create a clean heart in me, renew a right spirit yes. within me. Yes. There'll be an automatic response, God help me. We all need Jesus. Amen. We all need Jesus. And so Isaiah said these words. He was God's man. He was the best of the best in his day. He was God's prophet. But when he saw God, he said, woe is me, for I am undone. Then he said, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. God, give us a vision. Help us see God in a real way. Help us see you in a real way. God, give us a vision. Open our hearts. Open our minds. Let us... 
Help us see Jesus. How perfect is God? Well, He's the opposite of what Jesus looked like on the cross. What did Jesus look like on the cross? Now, this is not a fun topic. But the first time I really somebody actually shared with me what he really looked like, mm-hmm. I, I was never the same. Yes. He was beaten beyond recognition, the Bible says. Right. His form more than the sons of men. They whipped him. They plucked his beard out. We pierced his hands and his side, but he was literally just whipped beyond recognition. And he was the only one that could take that kind of beating. Why? Because he was perfect. He couldn't die. He had no sin in him. He wasn't born in sin, shaping in iniquity. And so therefore, he could take all the punishment of hell upon him, and he did. He took all the punishment for all the sin of all, of all humankind upon him, both, both past and present and future, were, ta- were, were met out upon him. Why? He took all that pain and all that punishment and all that anguish, and he took it all upon himself. Still, he didn't open his mouth. He didn't, he didn't lash out. He just received it. He took it upon himself. He, didn't, he just handled it. Talk about... Talk about tough. And he took it. He took it, and then when it was all when he was all finished, he said, It is finished, and he gave up the ghost. He couldn't die until he let himself, because he was flawless. He was perfect. The wages of sin is death. And Jesus had no sin. Yes. I'll and so the wage the he he didn't get those wages. But he took our punishment. And he died on the cross of Calvary. For your sin, and if you were the only person on the face of the world, he would have died for you. And here Isaiah, when he saw God, he realized how much they needed a Savior. How much he needed a Savior. How much the world needed a Savior. How much his people, he said, I'm a man of unclean lips because I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And so what did God do? What was God's response as soon as he said this? Did he berate him? Did he get on his case? Not at all. See, a man who, a man or a woman who will humble themselves before the Lord, God immediately has a response. God's only hard on people that won't respond to him because he's trying to get their attention. If you have a soft heart today and you know that you need a savior, God is a God is a God of love. Amen. And he wants to meet the need. And so listen to what happened. As soon as Isaiah acknowledged his faults, as soon as he had a heart of repentance towards the Lord, the Bible says, then flew one of those, these same seraphim and he unto, then flew one of these seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with his tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth. Notice what did Isaiah say? I'm a man of unclean lips. And so what did God do? He cleansed his lips. He took that coal. He laid it upon his lips. He said, thine iniquity is taken away. What's iniquity? It's known sin. It's something you knew was wrong and you did it anyway. You know, God can take away our known sin. Amen? Amen. And so God did that. Thine iniquity is taken away and thy sin. Thy sin. Excuse me. And thy sin purged. I sin purge. The word purge means a violent removal. A violent removal. God removed the sin away from Isaiah. Why did God do this? God loved Isaiah. Why will God do it in your life? God loves you. Why else does it, why also does he do it? Because God loves everybody that you're going to come in contact with. God loved the whole world. Amen. God loves you. He loves everybody around you. God has a work for us to do. And so what I'm trying to share with you here is when you come to the Lord and you say, God, I need forgiveness. And you come with a truly a broken heart. And you're not hiding behind your own merits and trying to say you're, all, you're good enough and you're all, I'm, a, I'm a pretty good person. You come to the realization that you need Jesus, kind of like I was talking about this morning. And you humble and you humbly come before the Lord. What does God do? He's ready to forgive. He's ready to restore. He's ready to heal. He's ready to pick you up. He's ready to do a work in your life. When we respond and we look at the Lord's in a serious manner, God is ready to meet the difference. Woe is me when he saw God. And this is what the book of Romans says. Is as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. A live, cold, divine helps available immediately to make the difference. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13 through 14 says, But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit down on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. 
He said, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? What do we see here? God sent an angel to help him. Amen? And when you pray, God sends out angels to help meet your needs. You may not see them, but they're all around. They're here right now looking down. God takes care of his kids. Amen? Amen. When you accept God in your heart, you've got a whole host of heaven on your side. That are willing to do whatever is necessary to help you make it to glory. See, brothers and sisters, we're not in it alone. We got God's help. Yes, amen. We're not in it alone. We've got an, we have a heavenly host that's on our side, and there's more that are on our side than are the, that are on the enemies. And we have God. <laughs> you really can't lose when you've got God. Amen? Yes, amen. But when we come to God, God is ready to meet the need. And why am I sharing this? I'm trying to relate to you today that we need to take sin seriously and we cannot play around with God. But when we're serious and genuine with the Lord, God is quick to forgive. I don't want you to beat yourself down, but I do want you to come humbly before the Lord. But then once you've you've come to God, get up and walk with Jesus and be what God wants you to be. Be strong, be courageous. Know that God is for you because if you because he, there's none that have come unto him that he's cast out. Amen? Amen. Yes, but yes, we need to take God seriously, not play around. But once we do that, God has forgiven you. When my son was little, I was very stern with him. Very stern. I'd march him around the house, call Cadence, sit him in the corner when he got out of control. Get your eyes in the corner. And I'd sit there and walk around the house. Oh, get your eyes in the corner. I said, Brother Ross, you're crazy. I was a sergeant. Whatever. Yeah, I was a little bit nuts. All right. But I'd sit there and put him in the corner. And I'd say, I'd hold him there. And I'd tell him, get your eyes in the corner. And he'd say, he would just sit there, a little toddler. He'd kind of kick a little bit. I was making sure he was listening to my, my voice. And he was taking that authority. And he was handling it okay. And he would sit there in the corner and whatnot. And then and once, and, and once he humbled himself and he was, everything was good, I said, all right, buddy, let's go play some baseball. I don't want him to sit there in a battle for the next seven days after he got corrected. Right. Are you listening? Amen. And God doesn't want you to sit there in sorrow and pain if you've asked him to forgive you. Amen? Amen. You're forgiven. Amen. Let's go play catch with our Heavenly Father. Amen? Amen. Let's go fishing. Let's play some, let's, let's, uh, let's have a jam session on the guitar, right, Jerry? Whatever. With the Lord. Let's have a good time. We had a good time in prayer meeting last night. Let's just enjoy God. Once, hey, if you've asked God to forgive you, he's not a man that he should lie. He'll forgive you. Amen? Amen. That's what his word says. Yes. Thy sin is purged. Jesus purged our sins. And this is referenced in several places. And I'm not going to go to all of them because I've already been longer than I anticipated. But I love this. He said, I love what he says here. Then he says in verse 6, I heard the voice of the Lord saying. I heard the voice, the voice of the Lord saying. This is how it is when a person really gets saved. They start to hear God's speaking to their heart. They start to hear the Lord speaking to their heart. God starts to deal with us and draw us. He says, now you're not going to necessarily hear an audible voice with this ear. But but there'll be a voice nonetheless that will speak to your heart. It'll tell you, I love you. I've forgiven you. You need to make church a regular habit. You need to read your Bible. You need to pray. I've got plans for you. You're my child. You're my kid. You mean the world to me. I've got something for you to do. It's time to grow up. You're not a little kid. You're not a little kid anymore. Amen. Now God will still play video games with us from time to time. God, we can have fun and be Christians. Amen. Amen. But we also have to grow up and be mature as well. There's a balance. Amen. Yes, Amen. Wouldn't it be funny if I was up here playing with my Star Wars guys preaching to you? I've got a couple. Don't do it, sir. <laughs> I got a cool Boba Fett back home, my smucker's jar. I got a Han Solo packed away in my collector's item from when I was a little kid. He's older than all of you. Well, not all of you. The juicy has got me beat. All right. Is he still alive? <laughs> <laughs> and Brother Walker, he's, I think he's got me by just a little bit. So, And all the other young folks that are here. But I'm not up here playing with my action figures. And I'm missing church because I'm playing, because I'm in there going, pew, 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 whatever. I say, Brother Ross, you're crazy. Well, you're listening now. Amen? God's good. And so we have to grow up. We have to we yes. keep that imagination of imagination of a little child because it's that imagination of a little kid that believes anything's possible. Yes. 
It was the imagination of a little kid that made you join the Marine Corps. Truth be told, you wanted to go out and you wanted to be Navy SEAL or be whatever. You wanted to wear that camouflage. You wanted to, you wanted, it was that imagination. Let God kindle that again and start to believe and start to dream and believe that God has something for you to do. Amen? At the same time, though, let's be mature. Let's be adults. Let's have the balance between both. And so he says, he says here, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah looked around. He's the only one there. Guess it's me. But notice God still asked him. God's asking you, will you come and give your life to me? Will you go where I want you to go and do what I want you to do and say what I want you to say and be what I want you to be? God may call you into the ministry. He may not. But he has called all of us into the ministry of reconciliation. Amen. Amen. That's to tell the world Jesus loves them to tell our stories with God of, of, of what God's done in our lives, to reach out to the world around us. He said, he asked him this question. He said, who will go for us? And what did he say? What was his response? What did he say? He said, here am I, send me. Have you, have you had a vision of God? Have you seen Jesus on the cross? Do you realize how much he loves you? Do you hear the voice of that love saying, who will tell somebody about me? Who will reach out to somebody in the barracks? Who will tell somebody God loves him? Who will go out and do uh, what I need to be done? There's so many tonight, church, that are hurting, that need God. And you know, because you've been there yourself. And I was there. I'm so thankful somebody came by my way. And that's why I'm here tonight preaching to you. Because I don't know where I'd be today if I'd even be alive. If it wasn't for a soul winner. Oh, thank God somebody invited me to church. Somebody stepped out of their... In God, they, they put down their, room, their controller, so to speak. And they got up and they got a vision for the lost. They became more concerned about others than their own little world. Are you, have you seen God this evening? As Sister Rossi comes to the piano and Brother Jerry. God's trying to move the obstruction of our mind so you can see, hear him tonight and you can say, here I am. God's trying to remove the obstacles that are blocking you from seeing him. The distractions. So you can hear his voice and his call upon your heart. Seeing God this evening saying, holy, holy, holy. Seeing yourself, what was me? Hearing the voice of, of Jesus, thy sin is purged. And saying in your heart of hearts, here am I. Send me. As you bow your heads and you close your eyes in reverence to God. Clean forever. Who will go, here am I.